Well, one of the things that we wanted to do tonight was to allow you to hear from some people who have been helped by some of the things that Florida does for children and for students. And we got acquainted with some people and they recommended a young lady to us who, a mother of children that go to Florida schools. I don't know if you think this way, but a lot of us realize that nobody cares for their children like a mother. And this mother realized that her student needed help. And thankfully there was a way to do that, and I don't want to tell the story, but Shakara Parks came all the way down from the Tampa St. Pete area, and she wants to tell her story, and we want her to tell her story of her involvement with her kids, so we're gonna invite her to come on up. And it's, sure, welcome. It's a great opportunity for us to hear from her, but be sure and notice that there was a solution that solved her problem, and this is what the Florida Citizens Alliance looks for. Solutions that we can encourage people to take advantage of, and solutions that we can help make happen. Shakara, thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, first off, I would like to thank you guys for giving me a minute of your time to share what the Step Up for Student Scholarship have done for me. So, um, first off, I'm a single mother of four children. I'm a full-time student, so I'm always beat. And it's always, it's hard to find good places for your, for your children when you're not in a good area. And please forgive me, I'm a little nervous. I thought it was gonna be about 20 people here. <laughs> um, so I'm in a community. <laughs> I am in a community that, um, the schools aren't as good. They're community schools. It's a majority of African-American, dominantly just, it's a lot of African-American children and the stereotype is really crazy. So for our parents in the area, it's very hard to be able to find a good school for your children that's in the area. You have to go on waiting lists. You have to wait years and years and years to the point like you never get it. Anyway, um, my daughter, it was her fourth grade year at a school that she had been to for her whole, you know, elementary school since kindergarten. And we, her fourth grade year, you know, she, I was just kind of like, I'm done at this point. Um, she came to me one day because I'm, I'm a mentor as well. And she's like, mom, did you see the girl just kick me? And I'm like, you know, what are you talking, can you go tell a teacher? So the protocol in public school is to first tell the teacher, then tell, you know, if, and these are all of the options if the first one doesn't work. Um, tell the teacher, then tell the behavior specialist. That doesn't work, go to the principal. File a bully report online, and then go to the school board. All of that was done plus more. I've even pulled a, con a couple of the children aside like, listen, you guys are girls, you know, blah, blah. And that still didn't work. I talked to parents. It still didn't work. Um, when I was able to, when I heard about Step Up for Students, I was so excited. Um, my daughter had already started a school on the scholarship, but I wanted to let my other daughter kind of go out with it because she had been there since kindergarten. And why would you want to take your children away from people? They grow, you know, they went... So anyway, I'm like, you have to do it, sorry. She started this school um, because the bullying was affecting her, her academics. Someone had touched her sexually. It was just so much going on. Um, and teachers just did not do anything. Um, she started this school, Academy Prep. Amazing, it was like a angel sent school, I don't know. Um, she has a, she's been maintaining a 3.0. Um, she's no, like innocent person to girl drama. So it, you know, it still happens, but they really, really put an up on it really quick. It's not lingering. They don't get to become physical. Um, and they let me know as a parent, she's okay. You know, we have her, she's fine. It will be okay. Um, I also have, my two sons were still at the same school. I thought, well, they can stay here because they're boys. Boys might be different, they're a little rough, you know. Um, no, it wasn't. 
my he's he's third grade now. He was first grade then, and he was like getting kicked in the back and like slammed, and so he started to act out. So all of the teachers would call me and be like, you know. Daquan's kind of acting up again. And I'm like, this isn't him. Like, he's, he's a genius. He makes straight A's. He does, like, he's amazing with academics. So that was never the problem. Um, I finally said, okay, I'm going to put my boys on the scholarship because this just isn't working for me. I put them on the scholarship. This year has been amazing. They're like, what? Who said that? He was... Like, he's amazing, and he tells me, he likes jokes, and because this is a Christian school, we are a Christian family. He always says, like, I'll be like, you know, what's anything going on funny or anybody bothering you? And he's like, no, this is a Christian school, Mom. Like, he doesn't get it, of course. <laughs> he's nine, and I, I also remind him, you know, just because it's Christian, it doesn't, you know. But um, Step Up for Student Scholarship is amazing. And I want to thank them. I definitely want to thank them um, from the bottom of my heart because the things that's happening now, it wouldn't have been happening. Um, my oldest, uh, she's in eighth grade now. She's maintaining a 3.75 and like she has all these high schools wanting to, you know, get her for high school and these colleges. And I'm just, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Great to hear a mom's story and hear the happy ending. I don't know if you're aware of that, but the scholarship program she referred to is a state of Florida solution to some of these kinds of problems. And the scholarship works a little bit like this video shows, so you'll have an idea of how they can do this. What is a tax credit scholarship? A tax credit scholarship is a private school scholarship given to students by a nonprofit that is funded by taxpayer donations. Where does the money come from to pay for tax credit scholarships? It starts with a nonprofit that relies on charitable donations to fund scholarships for kids. Taxpayers who want to support those nonprofits donate to them. To inspire people to donate more, the government offers them tax credits for their donations. Then, when donors file their income taxes, they are reimbursed for their donation to some degree by the state. Now, how do tax credit scholarships work? A parent works with a scholarship giving nonprofit and schools to find the right fit. Once they do, a child gets a scholarship of some varying amount to go to that school. Remember where the money comes from? The state can limit the amount it reimburses donors. The lower the limit, the smaller the scholarship for each child. The higher the limit, the bigger the scholarship for each child. Today, thousands of parents in states across America are using tax credit scholarships to access schools that work best for their children. Learn more about those families and the effects tax credit scholarships are having on communities at edchoice.org. These scholarships are available to students in Florida. The limiting factor is funding. It's a continuing challenge, but uh, we think it's a great solution and it's really worked for a lot of families. There are waiting lists to take advantage of these, so you can see how effective that is. So thanks again, Shakara, for coming. and. Uh, Let's get behind some of these solutions that the state offers to us. We'd like to introduce you a little bit to the Florida Citizens Alliance. I know many of you are aware of what we do, and there's information on your tables that we'd encourage you to take with you. Of course, we'll be around to answer questions if you'd like. But we thought one of the best ways to help you understand what we are and what we do is in this message from one of our interns. Hi, my name is Dominique Clemens. I'm from Naples, Florida and I'm an intern for Florida Citizens Alliance. My junior year of high school, I attended a large public school in Naples, Florida. This was the year of deciding which college I wanted to go to. One of the first that I checked out was Hillsdale College in Michigan. On a whim, my mom and I went to Hillsdale, Michigan on my first college visit. During this visit, I was exposed to vocabulary and concepts that I had never heard before during my public education. Words such as truth, liberty, and the liberal arts. Names such as Aristotle, Adam Smith, and Plato, which I thought was just a colorful clay for children. 
I had this awakening during my visit at Hillsdale College when I realized I am not getting a valuable education at my public school. I felt so far behind all the other prospective students that I met, and I was in shock at how uneducated and unprepared for college I was. I was an A student in my high school, and I thought that meant that I was ready for college, but I clearly wasn't. I decided to take my future into my own hands, and right before my senior year of high school, I transferred to a private classical academy in hopes that I could prepare myself for acceptance into Hillsdale College. My senior year of high school was exciting and full of learning that developed my critical thinking skills, which had been neglected in the public school curriculum. I was so inspired by this point in my journey that I devoted my senior thesis to the history of education reform. It was during this research that I realized, rather than being taught academic knowledge, children are being indoctrinated with certain political philosophies. This motivated me to get involved with Florida Citizens Alliance. I was accepted into Hillsdale College, and I am now a junior studying economics. In the midst of all this, I was connected with Keith Flaw and Florida Citizens Alliance. FLCA's mission resonated with my passion for education. They have given me the opportunity to keep my passion alive and work for them even when in Michigan for school. I am their web content and social media intern, which allows me to take my passion and love for quality education and inform new audiences on social media of the urgent problems in our education system today. FLCA is an advocate for families and works with legislators to give parents a voice and make school districts accountable to parents. I am so grateful to be able to support myself as a student at Hillsdale College while working for FLCA in an area that I am passionate about. I am able to put my time into this organization and also continue to enrich myself through Hillsdale's liberal arts education. Both Hillsdale College and Florida Citizens Alliance have helped me to develop as a person while developing my professional skills. This week, I am beginning my internship at the Department of Education in Washington, D.C., which is why I could not be with all of you today. I am so grateful for Keith Flaw, the president of Florida Citizens Alliance, for his hard work and dedication to this organization. Should this organization continue to flourish through your generous support, I would love to come back and continue to be part of this team fighting for better education in Florida. Thank you for your support. I encourage all of you to find us on Facebook and Twitter at Florida Citizens Alliance and FLCA for Liberty and help us to spread the word by sharing and liking our posts. We really couldn't do any of this without you. Thank you. Dominique mentioned Keith Flaw, and I want you to meet Keith and hear from him a little bit, and a lot of you know him. He's chief instigator, <laughs> and we're glad he is. So Keith, come on up, and uh, we'd like to have you introduce. Now, Dominique called you president, so I guess we have to call you by a whole new title now. Is brand that right? Brand new title, brand new title. Brand new title, yeah. Well, maybe you could tell us a little bit. We talk about these things to a lot of people. But one of the things that you and I have talked about and we've talked to other people about is the election that we just finished last fall. Um, you probably have some interesting observations about that, and maybe you'd be willing to share that with the I'd folks. I'd be happy right? to, Pastor Rick. Um, <clears throat> Florida Citizens Alliance is n a nonpartisan group. We focus very strongly on constitutional values and, our God -given ri and protecting our God-given rights. Uh, but there's some, some information I think that you ought to understand coming out of this last election that to me is, is, is shocking. We, had, we have 13 and a half million voters in Florida, right? We had 8 million vote in the last election. That's a pretty good turnout for an off-year election. Do you realize that 4 million of that 8 million that voted, voted for socialism? They voted for uh, sanctuary cities. They voted for abortion on demand and they voted for raising corporate taxes on small businesses 40%. Four million of the eight million. The margin of victory for our constitutional values was 33,000 votes in, in the, for the governorship. Why is that? We believe strongly it's our education system. We've had two generations of kids that are now teaching our kids that have come out of our liberal colleges. So it's time we stand up and fix that. Sure. One of the things that we do is we talk to a lot of people about schools and our vision for improving them, but also about 
how they're graded now. Everybody we talk to agrees with us that Florida grades schools on the curve, and we try to help people come to a little bit of reality about that kind of thing. The data shows some deficiencies, and we don't celebrate those deficiencies as much as they guide us, and we need to help our kids have a chance. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, your view of those things and how we might improve them. Well, the, 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 the real data is, uh, is again, shocking. Uh, if you look at the, the national tests our kids take, like the ACT, SAT, many of you are familiar with those we took them when we went to school? In Florida, 50% of the kids taking nationally normed tests cannot read or do math at grade level. We have 2.8 million students in Florida, and literally half of them cannot read or do math at grade level. In Collier County, where many of you are from, when we can get you the data, it's, you have a folder on, on your chart or on your table with uh, Collier County data, and we can get you the Lee County data if that, or wherever you're from. But in Collier County, 43% of our 46,000 students can't read at grade level. 49% of our students in Collier County cannot do math at grade level. Now, the really shocking thing, and many of you may have read this in the newspaper three weeks ago, uh, the, the, the school district and the state just declared that Florida, or the Collier County, has a 92% graduation rate. Ask yourself, how can that be? If half of our kids can't read and do math at grade level, how can we graduate 92%? It's called great inflation. It's called great inflation. Again, we have to do something about that. It's, it's, it's our kids' future that's being destroyed. And a lot of people know that we talk a lot about instructional materials and the desire to, to reform that, to have the best quality, the very finest instructional materials for our children. But there's an aspect of that that it's always difficult for us to talk about. I know I'm embarrassed when I have to go to a legislator's office and hand them that or talk to somebody else. In fact, in polite company like, like this, we couldn't read from some of the excerpts that we hand to these people who are school board members or other representatives of Maybe you can give us an idea of what's going on with this in a way that won't embarrass you or us, but will help us get the idea of what's going on here. Well, when I hand this, some of this material to our legislators, I, and, and particularly if it's a woman, I always say, uh, I'm going to blush when you read this. On your table is an excerpt, three pages, of, of uh, the only way to call it is pornography that's in our, that's in our schools. Uh, books like The Beautiful Bastard. Recommended reading for 11-year-olds in Collier County. Books like Beloved, The Bluest Eye, Killing Mr. Griffin. Now, these are all materials that we've documented across the state of Florida, and, and it's really not a surprise because all of these schools buy from the same few sources. But if you, if you open up that folder that you have, you can read some of the uh, specific language that our, uh, our kids are being introduced, introduced to. Now, there's really an important aspect to this, and I'm, I'm hoping the legislators listen to this carefully because I'm not sure you all understand this. In Florida, we have uh, the Department of Education has entered into a relationship with a group called FAME, Florida Association for Media, of, uh, Media in Education. And every year, from grades three through eight, this association picks 15 novels for grades three through eight that our kids are encouraged to read. And then the school systems throughout the state urge these and put programs in place for these kids to read those. The most shocking thing to us is that one of the key requirements to get on that list is the, 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 the novel has to be published 2010 or newer. So by definition, they're banning the classics and by definition, they're shoving pop culture down our kids' throats. And, and that's our school system. So again, we as, as community members, as parents, grandparents, have to stand up. But you left out the Pearson connection. Don't forget to tell people about that. I think they might be a little surprised. Anybody in here uh, heard of a company called Pearson? Pearson, uh, it's, it's, it's actually a British company. Uh, their third largest shareholder is the Arab Bank Corporation. And if you look at their shareholder list, it's many of the Middle East countries. Now, we've documented uh, over 90 textbooks and novels, and we've documented the religious indoctrination, but I would argue that that's not the whole story. What, what companies like Pearson do, and they now 
claim to deliver 80% of all the instruction materials in the United States. Let me say that again. They deliver 80% of all the instructional materials throughout the United States. They go into our liberal colleges and invite these professors to write, rewrite our history and to, and to rewrite our founding values and principles. One of the biggest things uh, we're finding in textbooks that will, will, should get your attention is that they're in, encouraging kids to get rid of the electoral college. That's the last vestige of our constitutional republic. So those are some of the ideas that are some of the facts that we deal with. And we hope that the, it's, it's kind of a somber note, but we hope that it helps you realize how important what we do is. All right, thank you very much. Well done. But I want you to meet our panelists and um, have an opportunity to um, welcome them here. Let's start with Dr. Larry Arn. Uh, right here, come on up, Dr. Arn. President of Hillsdale College. You heard from Dominique, one of their students. We also have uh, Dr. Bob McClure from the James Madison Institute. Come on up, Bob. Glad for you to be with us. And Neil McCluskey from the Cato Institute. Glad to have Neil here. I saw Bob Levy from Cato here earlier as well, I think. Is Bob still here? Yeah. Hi, Bob. Thanks for coming. And last but never least, and I had her last on purpose, is Erica Donalds. <laughs> Erica is a tire tireless advocate for children and for helping them have a good education. You know her as a re now retired school board member, and yet she has not stopped. There. She's working on things that we learned about just this week, so we're glad to have Erica here as well. Now, to begin, what I've asked the panelists to do is to, to give us a brief introduction to them and to their concerns about education, why they care about education, maybe a little bit about the organizations they represent. I work in education. I'm the president of Hillsdale College. I've been doing that for a long time now. Hillsdale College is a soon-to-be 175-year-old liberal arts college. It's got a storied history, founded by some people, some of whom became friends of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it's a very stubborn place. We don't take any money from the government. Uh, young Miss Clemens there, like everybody else at Hillsdale College, spends half her time studying a core curriculum that's very difficult. Uh, and education. So that's what the college is. The college has founded now and is helping to manage 20 charter schools. There'll be four more next year. Four of them are here in this state. Um, education is two things uh, that are make up the whole of it. First of all, it's simple. Uh, education means to lead forth. It's uh, what you need to know. It comes from a Latin word that means that. And what do you need? What's forth? Which way is forth? Uh, the Bible says, raise up a child in the way he should go. Which way should he go? And the answer to that is the way that leads to being a complete and fully functioning human being. And there's something about that, right? That's not just economics. That's not just making a living. That's not just thinking for yourself, although it involves that, requires it, because you have to what you think. So that's simple. And the second thing is it's sublime. Uh, it actually is one form of the highest human activity. It's a, a benefit to everyone who's involved in it. It's essentially an act of charity because it starts with the fact that you learn together, that's what schools are for, and that's how they work when they work best. But then finally, it's uh, when education concerns the very young, that's something that you do for the future. And that means that we tend to be serious about it. All these things that they just listed that are going on in the schools today, those are going on for a reason. They're going on because the people who do that think that they can turn the schools into a scientific engineering project and perfect them. And that's a good that they, that, that they seek. And they, they draw their strength from the inevitable failures everyone has in trying to learn and trying to be a fine human being. And so the point is, this contest about education is a contest about the soul of the whole country. Uh, 
Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm very honored to be here on this panel um, with, with some amazing people that I'm a huge fans of. So thank you, Florida Sins Alliance, for putting me up here. Um, first of all, a mom of three boys. I have uh, three uh, wonderful heartthrobs, 15, 11, and 7. And when uh, we started having children, I exercised the most prevalent form of school choice. I bought a house where I wanted my kids to go to school. And I thought that that was enough because, as was talked about earlier, uh, we grade our schools in Florida, and these were A schools. And therefore, they were going to be wonderful and perfect for my children. Uh, it didn't work out that way. There was a problem in one of my children's classrooms. And as I dug into it, I found out that it was actually a problem in the school, and then I dug into that and found out it was a problem with the district and dug into that and it was a problem with the state uh, who selected our, our standards and made all of these changes. Um, and as many of you were involved about eight years ago, we found out it was a problem at the national level as well. And we started a battle um, against the Common Core, against federal involvement in our education system. From there, I found out about Hillsdale College Charter Schools, got involved in a founding effort here found out that I was not alone as a parent who wanted something different for my children than the traditional public school within walking distance to my house, and uh, decided I would run for the school board here in Collier County because I was going to change the education system here in Collier County um, from that uh, post. Uh, many of you supported that effort and I really appreciate it. I do think that we um, did some great work while I was on there for four years. Um, I also helped to found a school board uh, coalition, the Florida, school, Florida Coalition of School Board Members for pro-school choice school board members across the state of Florida. We were able to have some considerable influence in Tallahassee on expanding school choice options. And I came to the realization in all of that work, both here and across the state, that competition and free market in education, allowing parents to vote with their feet, is really the only thing that is going to reform our education system. And so I've now dedicated my life and changed my career from being an executive in the finance sector for the past 16 years to devoting myself to the expansion of school choice and high quality school choice options like Hillsdale College Charter Schools across the state of Florida and eventually across the country. So I thank you for all of your support and I look forward to the discussion tonight with these wonderful folks up here. Uh, well, I'm Neil McCluskey. I am the director of the Center for Educational Freedom at the Cato Institute. Um, you probably know the chairman of the board, Bob Levy, who's back there. Anything that I say right or good today or that Cato does good is all attributable to Bob. Anything I say that's stupid is extra attributable to Bob. Um, if you don't know generally what libertarianism is, uh, there's lots to discuss. We could all talk after the event if you want. We'll get into the nuance of libertarianism. But generally, what we are interested in is maximizing the sphere of freedom in society, and it basically means people should be able to make decisions for themselves as long as they don't impose on other people. That's just a very broad outline. If you want to know more, talk to Bob Levy, because he knows everything. Um, why did I get involved in education? Well, it, part of it was, I don't know, maybe I was... Uh, overly optimistic, but it always struck me that sort of the soft underbelly of the big state was education because it made no sense to me that the way we deliver education is the state sets up schools and everybody goes to those schools. Um, it turns out a lot of people don't agree with me on that. Uh, and so I found that the work is a whole lot harder than it was going to, I thought it would be because I thought it was so obvious that everybody should be able to take education funding to the schools or to homeschool or to whatever arrangement they think is most effective for their child and that teaches and, and, and passes on the values that that family think are important. I thought that was obvious. Turns out it's not that obvious. So I've been involved in education now, uh, education policy for about 17 years. Um, and I also can't understand why anybody thinks it's a good idea to have the state shaping the minds of children. Turns out there are a lot of people I have to convince that that is bad as well. Hopefully not a lot of people in this room need to be convinced of that, but if you do, I'm gonna try my best tonight to do that. Thanks.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Bob McClure, and I am president of the James Madison Institute, which is Florida's oldest and largest free market think tank. We are based in Tallahassee, but we are statewide from the Keys all the way up to the Georgia line and across to, um, to Pensacola and Perdido Key, where uh, resident of Mike Hill is from. Uh, so we are uh, the state think tank for the state of Florida. One of our board members is here tonight, Glenn Blau. Many of you know Glenn and his lovely wife, Sandra Blau. Uh, Glenn has been on our board now for nearly 10 years. Um, uh, and Shakira, the gentleman who actually started the Step Up for Students program is a gentleman named John Kirtley, who is also on our board of directors from Tampa. John was in the private equity uh, world uh, and gave that up. He's probably about 52 years old, gave that up about 10 years ago and has devoted his life to school choice. And I wanna talk about that in just a couple of minutes. Um, and uh, I also have a question, uh, Shakira. I, I'm the father of two daughters, one 23 and 21. I, I wanna know if the girl drama ever stops. Does it ever stop? <laughs> okay. Um, I hadn't stopped in our household yet, so I'm still working on that. Um, you know, the, the great thing about the state of Florida and what I think is critically important for all of us to understand is that uh, Keith talked about the Electoral College. You really have four states that reflect the entire country, right? If you think about it, it's California, Texas, New York State, and Florida. You have California, which demographically reflects the entire country, and yet it's the poster child for everything that's wrong with economics, education, energy, and the environment. You pick it, that's the poster child uh, for what's wrong with, with those issues. You have Texas, which is a deeply red state, um, but it's west of the Mississippi and it's, it's, it's pretty deeply red uh, despite uh, Senator Cruz's recent election. Um, you then have New York State, which is the financial capital of the world. I'm sure there are, are many New Yorkers in here. Uh, and yet New York State's lost roughly 10% of the state's population in the last eight to 10 years, right? Many of you have moved here for, for tax reasons and, and the like. It's not just the weather. And then finally, you have the great state of Florida. Florida's more red than blue. Demographically, the entire country's here. You pick a, a demographic, it's here. It's rural, it's urban, it's roughly uh, 15 to 20% Hispanic, roughly 10 to 15% African American, military, retiree, retired military, um, millennials. You pick it, that demographic is here in the state. And yet, Barack Obama won the state twice, Rick Scott won the state twice, Donald Trump won the state once, Ron DeSantis won the state once, and in every one of those elections, the victor was by fewer than 80,000 votes. You think about that. Barack Obama beats Mitt Romney and John McCain, about eight million votes were cast, fewer than 100,000 votes decided that election. And so, and, and, and then the second component to that is that Florida, while more red than blue, is certainly some shade of purple. Uh, I, I think we could all agree. And yet, I think that we shouldn't collectively uh, cede any demographic to any, uh, based on any policy. We shouldn't cede, those of us who believes in, believe in a centered right world or a libertarian economic world shouldn't cede anything to uh, any demographic. And I'll give you a perfect example. We were talking about the most recent governor's race. JMI, the James Madison Institute, had a piece in the Wall Street Journal uh, during the Thanksgiving holiday. And there were approximately, in the most recent governor's race, approximately 650,000 African-American women who voted in that election. 650,000. Of that 650,000 voters, roughly 100,000 voted for Ron DeSantis. That's 20%. Of a, of a demographic that otherwise we're told nightly on cable news should be in the one to 2% range. Why? Why? It's because when they were surveyed, their response was Andrew Gillum opposed all forms of school choice. And I have children and grandchildren who partake in these school choice programs and I was not about to let him take those away. Therefore, I voted for Ron DeSantis. If we can, from a public policy standpoint, make it that personal in every area, it doesn't matter what the demographic is. It doesn't matter what state it is. It doesn't matter where you are. 
we can continue to grow the conservative movement. Ed Fulner talks about you grow by multiplication and addition, not division and subtraction. But you have to meet people where they are and you have to make the issues relevant to their daily lives and refuse to seed one single demographic. I'll close with this. The last thing that I think makes Florida so important is that we're in the Eastern Media Corridor. Texas is not. The Rick Scott Bill Nelson race got far more coverage than the, the uh, Beto O'Rourke Ted Cruz race. Every massive alligator that crosses some path in the Everglades is national news, right? On Fox News. Everything that happens in the state of Florida gets national news. Why? Because it's in that Eastern Media Corridor. And so I would argue that Florida remains and will continue to remain the single most important state in the country when it comes to public policy and when it comes to politics, which places a tremendously heavy burden on all of us in this room to be responsible. And first among equals when it comes to public policy is education and education reform. Thank you. I think in some respects you've addressed the first topic area we wanted to do. We'll, we'll see if you agree with that. Maybe you have something to add. Maybe our guests have some questions. But we broke this down into three topic areas that we want to work on. And the first one is this, education and the shaping of constitutionally informed citizens. I think you've heard a little bit about some of the struggles with that. Um, any of you want to add to what's already been I thought that was a remarkable introduction to that about how education must <laughs> be a part of that, or should we open up for comments? And I know Dr. Arn's school does a lot with the Constitution, and I know some of the rest of you do as well. Well, I'll just make one comment. Um, it's very hard for us today to understand the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, because the words in it are lost. What are the laws of nature and of nature's God? What can that mean? Uh, why is the right to property protected? Those are huge things. And so what schools are supposed to do is, first of all, get the kids good at the essentially human skills, which are reasoning, which includes both words and numbers, and reading, writing, and arithmetic. Most of school is about those things, because that's what we do. That's what dogs can't do and we can do. Every baby, every two-year-old learns to talk, and no dog has ever done it, right? And so... The first thing is, I mean, it's, it's shameful that we struggle to teach kids to read by the fourth grade because every kid who's not impaired, and very few are impaired, can, can learn to read by the end of kindergarten. And the reason for that is they already know how to read. And the reason for that is they start talking and they know what glass means. And that's kind of mysterious how they know, because how do we understand the common nouns, right? We can just do that. That's what we do. Well, all you got to do is take the sounds they know and apply them to the marks on the page, and soon enough they'll be reading. That's been known for a very long time, right? But after that, they need knowledge. And the knowledge is the knowledge of the world, of people, of the physical world, and of how people relate with each other. And that last subject, that's where citizenship comes in. And so you're never going to be very good at understanding your citizenship unless you're good at a whole lot of other things. But that is an essential component of school. I just want to throw in something that people may not always think about, at least when I observe lots of education debates. And that the tendency is that we all want to make the public schools teach what we think they should teach. So. Um, People with one view of the Constitution say, well, we need to make the teachers or the schools teach my view. Uh, people on the other side say, no, they have to teach something quite different. I would actually say that the way everybody will get what they want or the best way to get to what anybody wants is through school choice. Because what we've observed is most schools or many schools don't teach civics at all anymore. Now, to some extent, you may say that's good because they're not teaching things that you think are wrong or bad. But part of the reason they don't touch civics is because civics is something that's very uh, debated ground, where people disagree. And the public schools actually have a strong incentive to avoid 
teaching subjects where people disagree because they don't, you know, on a day-to-day basis want a whole lot of uh, sort of acrimony among parents at school board meetings within the halls of the school. School choice is the best way to teach civics because then people who have different views of what the Constitution says or the Declaration of Independence says or whether the founders were good or bad or whatever, they can seek out a school that agrees with them and then everybody can at least get rigorous content. So I would just urge people to step away from the fights to some extent of what the public schools are teaching. You still have to do it because you still have public schools. But the emphasis should be on school choice because then everybody can seek out a rigorous curriculum, even if we don't agree with what other people choose, rather than having to all support one type of school where a very common way to solve the problem is just avoid the topic completely. Well, that's a perfect... I I want to add something to that. Go ahead. So um, I agree with that. Almost entirely, I think. But there's another reason for school choice, and that is, first, a lot of K through 12 education is common sense. And, you know, it's just a fact that everybody, whether it's a libertarian school or a communist school, is going to think that the kids need to learn to read and get good at it, right? Because that's what people do. Humans do that. But the reason school choice matters is It is one of the places where we exercise self-government the most. Everybody who's got a family has a domain. And the huge responsibilities of steering the growth of a young soul, right, and keeping faith with a partner. And so that complex of love from which all human community grows, that used to be in charge of the schools. The public schools used to be organized exactly as you would want and I would want, right? And that means the first federal law on education is in the Northwest Ordinance. And it took the Western lands, which at that time was just the Northwest Territory, but then it was extended all across, including in Florida. And what they did was they sold all of it into private hands as rapidly as possible. You would like that. I would too, because... Private property was understood to be a public benefit, but then one reservation, schools in each township, and then the the, uh, section of land that was given for an endowment to support schools was given to the states with the direction that to use it for education in that township. So it's a prescription, and, and that's the biggest subsidy education has ever been given, bigger than these ugly and massive budgets we have today. And, and the idea was people know how to raise their kids if they're in any way fit to govern themselves, right? And so they should be in charge of the school with the teachers who live in the community and work with the kids and know their names. And you'll get, if you had school choice, you'll get a very wide res- variety of results and some of them will be good and some of them will be bad, but they'll vary around a line that's a lot higher than the line we've got today. One of the great things about an expert panel is they segue to the next topic really well because we wanted to talk about the idea of school choice and you'll see that up there and we'll give them another chance, but we want your questions real soon. So we've got people around the room with a microphone, so be ready when it's, Time, it'll be time, all right? Anybody wanna, let's go on to the topic of school choice because a lot of us have students that need help and uh, maybe we can talk about that and help us understand some of the solutions to that. So Erica, you and Bob have probably your first thing. I will speak to something that sort of relates to what Neil was saying as well. And one of the reasons for such urgency surrounding school choice for every family is because our schools today are teaching values. They're teaching culture to our students. And for many of us, there are values contrary to the values that we hold in our homes. But because they are spending so much time with our children, and because they're held up to be role models, and and many of them are teachers and leaders in our schools, our children are naturally going to look to them 
for these values and for direction when it comes to our culture uh, of the country and our, of our communities. So those of us who see such an issue with the direction of our country and the direction of the culture uh, have to look to the schools that have been shaping that for generations now, and this is the result. And for me, it is an emergency to get my children out from under those who would teach them values contrary to what I'm teaching them at home. And the a conflict that exists with me telling them that they should listen to their teachers because their teachers have the knowledge and the, that they need to teach them the skills every day, but don't listen to your teachers about this value and this value and that value. Uh, that is one huge reason for school choice, if not for also the higher quality that will inevitably exist when parents are able to choose between education options freely in a more free market system. Uh, so that, for me, is something that I think is underappreciated in, in the sense of urgency for school choice for every single family right now. I've seen this as a school board member and as a parent, and it happens even here where people say, well, we're very red, call your county. No, it's happening here as well in a very big way. Uh, so we have to uh, act on this immediately. That personalized instruction I mentioned earlier, I have three children. Uh, they are all boys, they all came from the same parents, they're all raised in the same home, and they're all very different in their learning styles. And although I may find a school that meets their needs, uh, one or more of them, uh, within that school there have to be different accommodations for their needs. And uh, for many of us as parents, you know, I, I talked about that exercising of school choice and buying the home in that particular community, but that doesn't mean, even if it is an A school, and even if it does work for my oldest child, that it's going to be the right fit for my second or my third child. So again, in order to meet the needs of every student, we cannot rely on the school choice of the past, and for those who cannot afford to purchase a home where they want their children to go to school, we have to give them the freedom and the ability to choose the right environment for their child. And as Dr. Arn said, that line of performance for those schools as they compete for those education dollars, we've seen in a microcosm with charter schools that go into neighborhoods that it raises the uh, performance of students in the public schools. If that happens across the board, I think we're going to see student performance like we have never seen before, even in like a state like Florida where we've seen some great improvement with accountability. Yeah, I want to say something briefly about civics, then I want to address um, Pastor Rick's question. It, uh, what we have found at the James Madison Institute is that a lot of people, young and old, frankly, who may inherently judge us based on what they think our economic policies may be or our views on property rights, are willing to engage with us when it comes to civics, when it comes to talking about civic engagement, um, the use of money, what is good debt, what is bad debt. Um, uh, even, even, I know this sounds crazy, but in the public school system, the virtues of the free enterprise system, we don't say capitalism, but certainly the, the virtues of the free enterprise system. And so we have found at, middle, at the middle and high school level, teachers first are hungry for content, um, and that we're able to engage them, and we've really focused on the use of money, uh, the virtues of thrift, and the virtues of the free enterprise system. We then took that to the college level. We're currently on 14 different college campuses. Free speech is a huge issue, so we segued from uh, civics to the First Amendment and the value and the importance of the First Amendment. We're at FAU, FIU, um, we're here at uh, FGCU, we're at uh, Ave Maria, UF, but you name it, we're there. And we have kids on those campuses who engage kids of all stripes, regardless of their political leanings. If you pull out party and you pull out politicians, oftentimes you can engage this vast middle that inherently you know, they're pro-socialist, but they don't really know what that means to the nth degree, right? And so we have been, uh, we've found at JMI, we've been able to do that. Um, on, the, on the school choice front, um, I think Neil's absolutely right. If you level the playing field, you can then allow people, regardless of their station in life, to meet the needs of their children, right? It's, it's, the, it's the virtues of the American dream. You're, you're allowing uh, parents and grandparents through their children and grandchildren to give them the opportunity at the American dream. 
Um, it's the same thing that's happening in the states. If you look at the most recent census, those states that value freedom, that value capital, that value markets, that value job creation, that's where people are moving. You've heard the term live free or die. We're all very familiar with that. Americans have chosen to live free or move. Mm -hmm. Florida's a perfect poster child for that, right? They're moving, they're not, they're not in Sacramento or San Diego. San Diego, they're in Boise. They're in Reno. They're in Tucson. And the same thing can happen at the state level when it comes to school choice. You can allow parents, and, and I, I, I refer back to the most recent election, they were, those parents and grandparents were going to vote their self-interest because they saw the needs for their children and grandchildren. I was joking about my daughters. They're very different. They each have different needs. But I, like everyone else in this room, has the ability to have school choice by either living in the right neighborhood or writing the check. It's a moral issue. You simply want to extend that to everyone. It seems those who oppose school choice almost in every situation have it themselves, right? And they're more interested in protecting the adults in the system than they are the children who are a part of the system. And that's the moral distinction that I think we can make and that will resonate with those who may not engage us uh, in, in other types of issues. All right, who has a question? Anybody? I, I see one here and I see one over there. But we'll start with Senator Baxley and come back to John. Well, we need a microphone though. Hold on, Senator. Thank you very much. Every senator wants a microphone, right? Okay, you're on. All right. Uh, I'd like for each of you to speak to the impact of the individualization of education and the role that uh, technology plays in that uh, and how you see that affecting education the years forward. Small topic. Uh, so I, I, uh, I think a lot of things are can be taught sort of automatically. I don't think that includes very many of the most important things. And the reason is uh, we're people radically made to talk to each other. And a classroom is an inspiring place, and every class is a product of everybody in it. And, and it's a discussion, right? And you, it, you know, I, can, I, I, I teach for a living, and I can tell you what happens. You know, I teach things that I've been studying for more than 40 years. And I never have a class where I don't learn something. But also, they're always telling you what they don't know every time they talk. And you respond to that, right? And then others help you, right? So I think that, uh, first of all, we, it, there's a crisis in funding schools. Just absorb this fact. More than half the employees of the public schools in America are not teachers. And we have 20 charter schools, and not one of them has more than one teacher, one non-teacher for every five teachers. You see, it's a 50% haircut before you even start. And then we think we can't afford the schools. And all of those people, you know, Neil is so very right. It, it, would, it, it will radically improve the culture inside the schools if everybody there wants to be there. And since the learning is in the student, the teacher just helps, the student needs to be a volunteer. And when they're young, their parents have to help them volunteer. But as you know, parents, every year that passes, they're more responsible, see? So the point is, we should keep the schools the way they are, but then there's lots and lots of things, job training, lots of things that can be taught automatically. And I agree with you about that. People should just have the option about that. Yeah, as a parent, um, I want teachers teaching my children. And uh, I was gonna let Dr. Arn answer that so I could say ditto, because I know he and I are, are very similar in our thoughts about technology in the classroom. What's happened with technology when it comes to education, if you look at uh, a place like Silicon Valley where they're ahead of the trends on, on things like education, the most privileged individuals in our, our country likely in Silicon Valley, first, when technology was available for education, were sending their children to schools that were full of technology and overflowing with you know, iPads and, and, and uh, laptops for every student and all of this with the teachers. But now, those same individuals are sending their children to schools that have no technology in the classroom and it has gone complete opposite. Um, my personal preference is not to have 
uh, the distraction of technology in the classrooms, especially at the younger ages for children um, who deserve to be taught by an expert in the classroom, who deserve to be taught by a professional teacher with passion for learning, uh, who's there to teach the children and who's capable of teaching children on an individual basis in their classroom. However, as a strong believer in education freedom, if a parent wants to send their child to a school that is full and overflowing with technology in kindergarten and have a personal, personalized learning program uh, that's based on their answers you know, with the click of a mouse, great. I want them to have the freedom to do that. I think that the children who are taught by great teachers are going to perform better. Um, and, and I'd like the transparency for those parents to see the results and be able to make informed decisions about where their child's gonna go to school. I think that plays itself out. My personal preference is, is more on the classical and traditional side of education. I think that's more rich of an experience for our children. It's what they deserve. But I do believe in a parent's ability to, to make that choice. Uh, I would just, first, I want to uh, second something that Dr. Arn said, which was, Neil was so very right. <laughs> but, um, I, I said that because the board chairman's here. <laughs> <laughs> Got that? Um, I, in, in, I, I mean, I think the answers have been right on, on technology. Uh, I think a lot of people, you know, 10 years ago in particular said technology is going to revolutionize education. We talked about, especially at the higher ed level, the MOOCs, massive online courses and things like that. And I think what we found is they're not something that a lot of people are comfortable with for education and they may not be all that effective. Um, and I think that uh, what we've seen of the research that exists on this is that Technology can be a somewhat more efficient way sometimes to teach specific skills, but it is very bad at what we would really consider education, which is to learning how to think, what to think about, how to grapple with real meaningful issues. And I do think, though, that the real test of anything we say may or may not be good in education is it has to be subjected to a market test. What are people choosing? What are people choosing? What are educators choosing to try? How do they change what they try when they find out it doesn't work or it doesn't work for some people? And so I would never make a blanket statement that says, oh, don't go down the technology route. Some people, I hope, do go down the technology route, really test it out, change it when it needs to be. And I sure hope other people are going to try more traditional education and that ultimately everyone gets to choose what it is they want. And then you'll get a good test of what works for most people, what works for some specific people, and the one thing we want to avoid is what we've seen in so many schools like you talked about, which is some, you know, a, a superintendent or a state secretary of education decides technology is the way to go. We're going to put a huge amount of money into technology and then we find out it doesn't work. And oh, by the way, the kids break through all the protections we're supposed to have keep from bad things on the Internet within five seconds. And none of the adults know how to stop them, uh, which is what we we've seen in many of these cases. So. Technology can be good, but we want a market test, not a top-down state implementation or imposition of technology. Technology is a means to an end. It's not the end. As someone who uh, came straight out of college uh, and taught high school English for three years and coached football, basketball, and baseball and lived in an all-boys dorm, there, there, there is no substitute for that spark, that connection between teacher and student. There's no, there's no substitute for that. That's why I'm a big believer in every time the left or the, the public school system says, um, you know, we need to pay teachers more, I say, great, let's pay teachers more. Let's play our, pay our good teachers really well if you will get rid of your bad teachers. And they, they never respond with that kind of answer. Because there is no substitute for a great teacher. Pay them really, really well, be able, like employees, be able to quantify that they're good teachers, but then get rid of or help the poor teachers get better. Right, but that the, the unions never go for that. Having said that, I do believe for the foreseeable future, kind of the traditional seven period, you know, grind it out, 280 days a year, go to ball practice afterwards, have dinner, do your homework, get up, do it again. I think those days are, are for the foreseeable future are over. You think about your children or your grandchildren, they have 10,000 apps on their phone. Um, 
They can go to the grocery store and get 20 different colors of ketchup. They can buy milk for people who are lactose intolerant. Milk. You can buy milk for, for people who are lactose intolerant. This kind of seven period a day grinded out thing is, is, is for the foreseeable future moving away. Now, and this is no surprise to anyone in this room, it's two or three periods at the local school of choice, maybe the junior college for a class or two, uh, Florida Virtual School, which is a um, massive tool here in the state. You could take PE on Florida Virtual School. You can take PE on, yes, you can, right? And so this notion that these kids are gonna do this seven periods a day when they have this need for instant gratification or instant you know, desire. I think that's gone for the foreseeable future. I'm not suggesting that's bad, but what, but what I am suggesting is the teacher-student spark can't be replaced, and that is something we're gonna have to grapple with in the future. I, John, I think, oh. I think it's counterfactual that those schools are gone. I know a bunch of them, Run, running a bunch of them. They're growing 20% a year. But you're right, the classroom's not supposed to be a boring or a rote place. And just, just remember this great thing, like, have you, do, you, do you have a teacher in your memory that was important to you? Sure. What happens in college is they start acting like them. Like if somebody's got a little facial tick, a whole bunch of students will develop it. <laughs> and, and why? Because they're watching them to learn how to be. You see, in the learning context, right? And I don't think that's going to go away. I think that's how human beings are. John, you had a question? Question for Erica Donalds and Bob McClure. We have a unique provision in our state constitution, Article 9, Section 1, which requires the state to provide a uh, uniform, efficient, safe, la 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 la, public adequate, school system. Adequate, adequate, yeah. adequate. Yeah. Do you think this? objective if this language is objectively interpreted that it does provide an impediment to a robust school choice system in florida or does that have to be overcome some way if it's properly interpreted on its face you or me you can go first oh, well, i i know a little bit about this topic perhaps um <laughs> i did serve on the constitution revision commission last uh this past year and did a lot of work in education in regards to this article i would have liked to thrown away the whole article and written it all over again uh, from a, a higher purpose perspective, um, but alas, <laughs> the Supreme Court had other ideas about our, our um, education proposals. Uh, it is an impediment, but I don't think it is forever. Um, I think that we will see uh, ESAs, uh, education uh, scholarship accounts, come through the legislature very soon, if not this session. Um, Bill Galvano, the president of the Senate, was uh, speaking this week and said that they were going to do some very bold things with regard to ESAs. It was very encouraging. Um, and we do, thankfully, have a new court, a uh, new Supreme Court, thanks to our new governor, Ron DeSantis. Um, yes, bravo, Ron DeSantis. Um, if you're not aware, our Florida Supreme Court has been an incredible uh, blockade to school choice expansion in the state of Florida. Every school choice initiative that has been put forth has been sued by the teachers union, by the League of Women Voters. And if it gets to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court uh, thus far has struck down every single one of those initiatives. And in some cases, it didn't even make it there because we knew... It, it's not going to happen. Uh, four of those justices, uh, three of the justices the, of the four that always voted against school choice are gone now, retired as of just two weeks ago. And thankfully, just as important as the, the federal Supreme Court appointments that have been made recently, we have uh, three new appointments, two of which have already been made by, by Ron DeSantis. So I said all that to say that when ESAs come through uh, the court system, we believe we'll get a fair interpretation of the Constitution. Uh, the, one of the biggest challenges has been that word uniform, and it has been interpreted in the past to be the public school system, the bureaucracy that we all know and love, haha, -ha, um, that that is what Floridians in 1968 uh, determined that we should have and that, that they somehow knew that charter schools and ESAs would, would be in place later on and they would not want them to exist. Um, I think that any common sense person would reject that notion and uh, that uniform could be reasonably interpreted to be uniform 
funding uniform opportunity for each and every student in the state of Florida, and we hope very much that that is the interpretation that comes forth when, and we know that it is a when, uh, the opposition sues for education scholarship accounts and any other school choice reforms that come through the legislature. I would add to that that um, you know the adequacy lawsuit was most recently thrown out by the courts just recently, and for those of you that may not be from around here, you know, uh, that, that this idea that what is adequate funding of education, what does that mean? And there was a danger that somehow the courts would be able to determine that, which is a very scary proposition. To Erica's point, John, she's absolutely right. Uh, you're going to see a legislature and a governor move boldly and a commissioner, Commissioner Corcoran, who are going to move boldly and quickly to continue to expand school choice uh, on the theory, much like the left's view of entitlements, once you have these big, large school choice options, they're gonna be very difficult to take away, right? And so you're gonna see them move boldly. You have a Supreme Court that's flipping. Uh, the, the, the left is losing ground politically. They've lost ground morally for the last 20 or 30 years, but the, the, <laughs> the ground is shrinking. And, you know, in the words of General Custer, sir, we've got them right where we want them, right? That's, that's what they think, and yet they continue to lose ground, and the Florida Supreme Court is the last bastion of that. So you're gonna see Florida continue to lead the country on school choice and education reform programs. And I don't think that issue, your your point about the Constitution is gonna be a problem. Having said that, um, you know, were we to have a left a, a left leaning court, we won't for, you know, six, eight, ten years, but th there is a chance that that could flip at that point. All right, I think we're seeing a little bit of the third item we wanted to get to about the future. We're hearing a little bit of the description of the future and before we go down that road, let's have a question or two and uh, welcome you to the conversation. Thank you. Um, my question concerns um, rankings. Um, I'm curious about charter schools. I've read a number of articles that say that the results from charter schools are a little better than public. And I don't know if that's factual or not. And I wondered if you could give me some uh, response on that. Thank you. Oh, I'll sure. start on this. Um, sure. And thanks for the question. Charter schools do outperform uh, traditional public schools in Florida. The, the Florida Department of Education puts out a report, uh, little reported on by the media, surprisingly. <laughs> um, but they are uh, proven to not only perform better in every subject area that's tested, but also in closing the achievement gap. Um, between minority and low-income students and, and their white and higher-income counterparts. Yes, you have a follow-up. Very large? Um, it's not overall, it is not a huge margin, no. Um, I would say, though, that when parents are choosing that school, to the, to the parent, it's a large margin from where they want their children to be to where they are. And the fact that they are outperforming is enough to uh, warrant that the availability of that choice for those parents who obviously are happier with the charter school than they are with their traditional zoned school. I think the com combination of those two things um, should cause us to continue to allow for more of those choices uh, so long as um, the parents feel that it is a better fit. I don't believe that uh, performance, although it is per a very important academic performance, should be the only factor in our determination on whether uh, parents should be allowed those alternate choices. Um, I will say as well, when it comes to the, the expansion of charter schools and looking at charter schools, especially in Florida as a whole, they're all very different, very different uh, in terms of their programming, in terms of their curriculum. You have charter schools that are for uh, students who are at risk of dropping out. They're in that number. Uh, you have charter schools like some of the, the Hillsdale schools that are here that are in that number. You have online charter schools that are in that number. So it's, it's, it's a little bit unfair to judge all charter schools by this overall performance when each one of them is so individually different. And I think that that goes back to uh, what Neil was talking about earlier, that regardless of how the school is performing, I believe we... Um, if, if it's publicly funded, we need to make sure that there is transparency in the performance of those schools and uh, make sure that parents can make informed decisions with their education dollars. But aside from that, 
allowing parents to make those individual choices based on the needs of their students, uh, to me, is, is more important than uh, measuring this performance on this, on this grander kind of global level. Each individual school should be held accountable by the parents, by the sponsor uh, for getting public funding, but most importantly by the parents. The parents are the ones who hold each school accountable if they can leave at any time and go to a different school that fits better. Yeah, this is, uh, I just want to say, it's, I think it's really important to understand that most of these evaluations are based on standardized test scores. And what we've been learning is that standardized test scores only tell us so much. And in fact, if you track later term achievement, and it can be, do you have a job? Are you staying out of jail? Things like that. That those test score, actually, most of the research is, have you gone to college and are you succeeding in college? But that shows a real disconnect between standardized test scores and whether or not people are succeeding later on in life. It's not to say that the standardized test scores tell us nothing, but we've put far too much emphasis on those test scores. And part of that is the federal government, under the No Child Left Behind Act, essentially imposed that on all states and charter schools, because we need to remember charter schools are still public schools, and so they were subject to those sorts of rules. And I think we've learned more and more that while those tests may tell us something, they don't even come close to telling us everything. And that's why the decisions of the parents and of the educators, having autonomy for those educators and, and like-minded parents and teachers coming together is so important. And the other thing that's also important is we all the time in public policy say, well, you know, are the charter schools doing better than the traditional public schools? And are they doing better than the private schools? But if you're a parent, it doesn't actually matter to you is one sector doing better than the other. What you care about is do you have good school options regardless of what sector they're in. So I also always want to caution about saying, well, the charter schools only get slightly better scores overall. We should not get excited about charter schools. If you're getting a lot of options as a parent and some of them are better than the others, you don't really care what sector it is. T t Ten years ago, there was a bipartisan consensus, except I didn't agree with it. Neil didn't agree with it, uh, that uh, uh, testing was the way to go. Because that's how, you know, somebody from the first uh, the George W. Bush administration asked me to be a spokesperson for the No Child Left Behind Act. And I said, well, that's a bad title. And he said, it's a great title. I said, have you ever been in a classroom? You know, that happens every day. But so first it was testing. And there's a reaction against that. The Common Core is actually more intrusive because it's an attempt to control curricula. And, and their argument would be that when there's failure, each failure calls in, into being more of the same thing, right? And the Common Core, the way it works, by the way, is it's a perfect and beautiful bureaucratic production. It's, a, it's written so that, uh, you know, it, I actually contributed to the first state standardized test, st test standards for the state of Texas because somebody from the McNair Foundation asked me to do it when I was working in Claremont. And he sent me the standards. He was, he was ebullient. Everything you recommended is in. And then he sent me the standards for the schools. And they're this tall, right, which means they're not standards. You can't teach all that. A, a, a kid couldn't read that in six years, just the standards. So the point is, the idea is this notion of centralized management calls in more of itself. And it won't work. It, it can't possibly work. And so I, I think that if there's to be state standardized test, they should be. Because, you know, by the way, you can write uh, three formulas and for a grade level. And if the kids can work the formula, they understand math, right? And it should not, and so can you read a paragraph and say what it says? The state standardized set t test should be one hour long. And that way, if, if there to be, I'd get rid of them all myself. But if there were to be such a thing, it should be very general. And then you're right, you know, finally, you know, the, the fellow from the Bush administration said to me, he said, but if we don't have these tests, how will parents know if their kids are learning? And I said, gracious, did you actually mean to ask me that question? <laughs> you know, that's insane, you see. 
And so I'll close with one point. The data indicates that if there was universal school choice, all of the schools would be above average. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to add, can I add to that on the charter school yeah. component? The, the bottom the line point. is that marginally it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because there's the old quote that figures don't lie, but liars figure. And what you're talking about there is this notion of test scores, whether the charters are marginally better or not. Most parents don't, to Erica's point, they're not, they're not boring down into those details. They're focused on what the needs are for their children and grandchildren. It might be science. It might be safety. It might be... Uh, learning disabilities, whatever the case may be. And so this kind of media component of, well, charter schools are slightly better or as they, they would probably argue slightly worse, whatever, it, it's, it's not really relevant because if you open the market, the families will tell you what's working and what's not working. And the, the great thing about charter schools and parochial schools and virtual schools is that if they're not working, they will go away. But what do you do with a horrible, lousy public school? It doesn't go anywhere. It gets more funding. Good. I just want to throw one real fast thing and it only took a second. Okay, already took a second, but it'll take two seconds. But there's actually great research also right here in Florida by David Figlio that found that where there's school choice, the traditional public schools actually improve because they have to compete. Yep. So even that test score is a, is a moving target because competition helps to push it far. That's exactly Father right. Phil, we're ready. Yes, thank you, Pastor Rick. Can you hear me okay? Is this on? Yes. Okay. Um, it uh, seems that the better students at our church, the St. Catherine Greek Orthodox Church, who are in high school, are opting out of more time in the classroom at their high schools, and they're going to their local community college or somewhere, and they're taking college classes. Um, in light of the work that's um, taking place at Hillsdale College, there's more and more online uh, classes being offered. I'm just wondering, how do we expand that option of school choice? So the students who are in high school don't just have the option of going to their local college when they're off campus so they can take their, their um, course of study, but perhaps take more and more classes um, online that would be considered to be uh, legitimate, acceptable, um, something they could get credit for. It seems like that option of school choice expansion has to be expanded. So uh, please speak to that a little bit. Uh, so I'll, I'll say two things about that. Uh, remember, you have to remember that there's a wide variability in what we call college class. <laughs> um, uh, there's also a, a, a significant variability in the academic ability and diligence of students. And so some students, you know, there's a fellow who's a physics professor at the University of Maryland who graduated from Hillsdale College when he was 16 years old. And... <coughs> And he's just real smart. And, uh, you know, his, his best friend was a star offensive tackle on the football team. And if anybody hazed that boy, they met with destruction. So it, it changes by the student. But remember, there's a list of things you need to know, you know, to grow up to be, to know what you need to know to be a human being, right? And, and, uh, uh, I agree with Neil entirely about who should be the judge of what those things are. But I think that the things exist. And, and then in the typical kid, in most kids, if you, have a, if you go to a really hard high school and then you go to a really good hard college and then you go to graduate school, you know, then you're going to learn a lot. And some can do that quicker than others. But it's also true, if it was just a good idea to relax high school so that the typical kid could go to college, why not graduate school, you know? So, and then online courses, we have uh, 1,500 students at Hillsdale College, and we have 2.2 million online students. <laughs> and, and isn't that weird? And, uh, and, and, you know, there's 11,000 kids in these charter schools, and the, the goal is to get it to 50,000. So those things operate on a much bigger scale. They're a different kind of thing, right? People come, and pe people come to hostels in the summer. You know, they flock to them. They sell out by January, and we have like seven or 800 people come and spend a week. We do it all summer long. We, don't, we can't find enough places to do it. 
And they'll say to me on Thursday night, they'll say, they've been there, you know, they're leaving on Friday, and they'll say, I just wish I could come to college here. And I typically say, let's test that. Why don't you write me a 10-page paper by tomorrow morning at 8 about what you've learned? <laughs> you, you know? <laughs> and then maybe they don't want to. And, and the point is, there's, a, a, here, there's a, an inspiring woman. We provide the civics curriculum. She started a welding school in Detroit. And for, in 15 weeks and for 12 grand, you can be a certified welder, and two weeks after that, you'll be making 85,000. And I've had, I've had three graduates, because you know it just so happens in my benighted career when I was growing up, I always, for some reason, gravitated to hard jobs. I helped build a Kmart on Highway 41 down in Naples. And one, one year, and after school work and summers, I was a welder. I liked to do it, it was fun. I've talked about that. I've had three graduates of Hillsdale College go and, be, and learn to be welders and make 85000 for two years and pay off their debts and then go to law school. Of course, there should be very wide variety of opportunity and different subjects need to be taught in different ways. I'd like to add, uh, Father, that, that that's my point earlier, is that, that that is where we're heading. Where it ends up, nobody knows. But Florida, for example, has one of the largest virtual schools in the entire country, um, and just FLVS. And so you're going to see more of that with young people uh, traditionally across the board. As I've said earlier, the teacher-student spark can never be replaced, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but my, my girls went to a class, traditional classical school, but there was, um, you know, the opportunity to also participate in Florida Virtual School, and I think you're going to continue to see that to grow. I think this does speak to the future of education, especially in Florida, where I think we are a little bit spoiled because when we talk to people across the country about school choice, they're like, oh, if we could just get to where Florida is, and we're like, we have so much to do. We have so much further to go, so we're not happy with where we are, which is a good thing, but we, we are a lot further along than many other um, states. We do have a program in Florida called the Gardner Scholarship, which I, I would say is the model for ESAs going forward. And that scholarship allows parents of students with disabilities uh, to take that pot of money and use it for various expenses, including tuition, but also curriculum and materials. They could pay for a single online course from a different type of provider than perhaps the private school that they might be attending. Um, and that is a, a, a future, hopefully, for Florida, for all Florida families to be able to take advantage of. When it comes to dual enrollment, hopefully that would be a possibility. The, the expansion of dual enrollment in Florida, the reality of that, and many conservatives are opposed to dual enrollment. They don't think we should be paying for college for high school students. However, the reality of dual enrollment is that high schools are outsourcing the teaching of their high-performing students. So instead of having courses that are challenging enough within the high school for high-performing students, they pay the local community college or the local university to teach those students. And the students have a benefit of getting college credit in many cases. Uh, so I'm not opposed to dual enrollment because I want those children uh, to have the, the challenge and, and the ability to be able to take advantage of that choice. Um, but I think that the future is that with a gardener type scholarship program for every single parent, they'll be able to pick and choose whether it's tutoring or one-on-one -on -one instruction in a particular area where their student is struggling, uh, private school tuition for half the day for the, the courses that that particular school offers, and then a dual enrollment course or, or a curriculum that they can utilize at home. I'd like to see every parent to be able to take advantage of all of those options with a, a pot of money that's appropriate for their child. Yeah, I think that's the future. Is, yeah, me too. It's school choice, general, educational freedom, not just school choice, and it's through ESAs, which do go beyond school choice, where you can apply that money to all sorts of educational options. So just yeah. in short, that, I think, I hope, is the future of education. So the one thing I would add is I also don't think people need to spend some of their own money on education because when people say we shouldn't be having the school district pay for free college, we do have a problem of massive credential inflation because third yeah. parties, in particular taxpayers, not at Hillsdale, <laughs> but elsewhere are paying so much of the bill. So I hope we have ESAs that are coupled with some expectation that people will pay some of their own 
right. calls for education. So they're disciplined in choosing something that they really think is best. Remember this. High schools are are not just offloading high-performing students. High schools don't t teach kids to read and write very well anymore. So some things that ought to be taught in high school end up being taught in college. But then the, the second thing is high schools sh should be better, right? If, if, you, if, if the schools were better, if the teachers were more inspired, teachers live at the bottom of a vast bureaucracy now. And they used to be symbols of wisdom in the community where they live. And the point is, there'd be more people go into it. And there'd be people who can teach physics and math and history and everything, right? And then the high school students wouldn't have to go anywhere else. And that, that would be better in many cases. I have a question. Back. Yes, ma'am, please. I do have kids right now, school age kids. My daughter's a senior. My other daughter is a freshman in high school. And we homeschool. And I hear a lot going on here. Where's our speaker? Where, where'd she go? Girl, I have respect for you. Good job. I think one of the biggest problems is that we're expecting everybody else to fix it. As parents, she took the initiative. She said, not my kids. You know, now, do I, can I go out and teach quantum physics? No. But if my kids, do you want to learn quantum physics? <laughs> okay, she doesn't want to learn quantum. But if I thought she needed to, I live in Florida. Do you know how many quantum physicists there are here? I can find them. And I can have the best tutors in the world, or at least in the state of Florida, for my kids because... It's my job as a parent. You, you guys, many of you are probably grandparents in here. You're the answer to your grandkids. The schools are great, and I'm not saying that schools are irrelevant, but I think the biggest responsibility is for us as parents and grandparents to be parents and grandparents. Read to your kids. Read, 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 read. Read good books. Read hard books. We read a book. We're reading a book in our senior co-op right now, and the kids said today, all three of my seniors said, I had to read it three times to figure out what they were saying. Good. I, I know that wasn't a question. Yes, thank you. It was a question. I yeah, forgot it. That's okay. I want to respond to that just quickly about the culture of what public schools have done to parental responsibility um, for education. Uh, when my son went into kindergarten, I got a letter and I kept it. Um, so I have a copy of this letter that told me not to teach my child letters at home, to only allow the teachers to teach him because they will know when he is ready. And this, so this is the first letter I get from the teacher of my son's public school telling me as a parent, you don't have a role here. Only we know how to teach your child and you should stay out of it. Uh, that's the message that our parents are getting in the traditional public school system over and over and over again. And so I, it goes back again to the idea of the values that are being taught in our schools, not just to our children, but to the parents of our children, telling them that it's the government's responsibility to teach their children. That's the message that they're sending, and that's a culture change that we, as citizens, need to help change. So thank you for your comments, because I agree with you, and that's, there's a bigger conversation that, that needs to change. I think going back to everything we've said, school choice is gonna help with that. Yeah, and, and the way it, it partially helps is you can actually, I think, sort of understand the position of the teacher, where if they say, look, the school is teaching this one way, if the child goes home and the parents say, no, that's wrong, do it another way, uh, that you're at cross purposes, and of course the child is caught in, in between. But that is why school choice is so important, because the educators and the families who are seeking the education come together voluntarily agreeing on things so that the school and the family can move forward together rather than constantly being at loggerheads or walking on eggshells to make sure nobody gets upset. And that's something I think is a message should appeal to everybody, no matter what side they're on, 
that if you want schools to be effective, you need to let people choose schools. You need to give educators the freedom to run schools or educational arrangements as they want and bring them voluntarily together. What I found is that that message does not resonate with very many people because there seems to be an overwhelming tendency of saying, well, that should work for me, but other people shouldn't be able to choose things I don't like. And that is a message we've got to change for everybody. We should stop fighting about what one school we all have to pay for teaches and say, let's all have schools that we voluntarily choose that can all teach different things so we don't have to be at loggerheads and then often teach kind of lowest common denominator uh, curricula. Uh, I, I want to say something about parents real quick. Um, so one of my parents is back there, right? And he walked up to me and told me how grateful he is for the college. We have uh, an institution, we have Parents Weekend twice a year, and if you got a kid at Hillsdale College, you get 10 minutes with every teacher the kid's got. And those are love sessions, right? And why are they that way? First of all, they don't think they know better than we how to teach what we teach, but we are very happy to have them involved. And we get very few cases of parents saying, no, you're teaching this wrong, or no, I don't want this. And part, part of the reason is I fancy we're pretty good at what we do. But the other thing is what your point is, and that is, you know, if a kid's really bad at Hillsdale College or they're resentful or something, I always say, you know, there's 2,500 colleges. Are you in the right one? And they usually straighten up when you say that to them, see? <laughs> so if, if, this, this thing about parents and teachers, I have a vast experience with that. It's inspiring experience, right? And it's bound to work if you're both serving the interest of the student to the best of your ability. There won't be very much conflict. I see Keith has found his voice. He was losing it earlier, yeah. earlier today, but he's found it enough to ask a question, so I, I do have a question, and uh, we're big fans of the Gardner Scholarship, which I think JMI played a role in mm -hmm. developing back when. The concern I hear from uh, homeschool parents and a lot of other folks that are paying close attention, that choice means something different to everyone. And if you have a school, if you have a choice program where the, 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 curric, the standards, the curriculum, and the testing is all a national driven thing, all you've got is one flavor of ice cream That's right. in every channel of education. So how do you protect in, in Florida? How do we protect and, 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 and frankly get the legislators not to overreach and, and let there really be school choice, right? Driven by parents. Yeah. First. Well, as of, as of right now, the students who are taking advantage of private school choice through tax credit scholarships in Florida have a menu of tests that they can choose from for accountability purposes, which I think is reasonable um, so that you're not stuck to one test so long as the menu is vast enough that a school can say this is a, a reasonable measure of our performance uh, for that for that public funding. I think applying that to other schools of choice, such as charter schools and uh I, I hesitate homeschool families. I think that they should uh, be able to make some judgments about what their success looks like. But I do agree with the policy now for private school education and would like to see the, le the list of tests um, or measurements perhaps expanded so that there is some level of accountability, but that is driven by the parent choosing the school that says, this is how we measure success, and this is what you're going to see as far as reporting back to you on what our success looks like. I think the school should have a major role in defining what their success looks like. The parent should sign on to that when they choose to go to that school, and then that's how um, the state should accommodate for that measure. Also think, obviously, Nirvana would be right. The money follows the child, right? Where whatever the decision is made by the parents or the grandparents. Having said that, I think leadership has shown um, that they're not interested in. Uh, and of course, it's I'm generalizing. You know, you've got a com new commissioner of education, former House Speaker, raised his kids in homeschool, raised his kids in classical schools. Um, and the leadership has, by and large, agreed with you, and, and they haven't overreached. And, and frankly, Jeb Bush, you know, just putting Common Core aside where he was vastly wrong is the kind of the godfather of school choice in Florida when he, when he, when he was governor in 1998. I mean, he really is. He's the godfather of school choice at the state level across the country. That's another topic for another day. He was wrong on Common Core. Um, and, but he, what, what he spawned has been leadership that— I think in the state, um, 
elected leadership, by and large, understands these, these men and women in this room tonight understand the nature of your question. And there, there's no haziness there and there's no wringing of hands. And I think, you know, we currently have leadership at the state level that understands exactly what you're, what you're asking and is really not an issue at the moment. And, and em empirically, there's evidence that tax credit scholarships are much less likely to be regulated than vouchers. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, vouchers are better than the status quo, but because the money goes from the state directly to a parent, there's a tendency of people to say, and good, you know, good-willed people, well, I want to make sure that that money, which is my money, is being used well. That means you can't teach certain things, you have to get certain test scores. The power of the tax credit funded scholarship is that the donor chooses mm -hmm. to donate. So it's up to them. They're not being compelled by the state to do it. And so what we tend to see is those end up being less regulated. Many states also have multiple groups to whom you can donate, and that's even more freedom. So you say, if I don't want my, I don't want scholarship money going to an arts-based school, I want it to go to, I don't know, STEM school, you can designate the STEM school and say, look, that's where I want it to go. So that's even more freedom. And the ESAs also are probably, they're newer, so we don't have as much history and evidence on them. They're probably also much less likely to be regulated than vouchers because you can use them for so many things beyond just choosing a school. You can use it to buy a homeschool curriculum, tutoring, all sorts of things. So this sort of moving away from the state giving you money to go to a particular school is, I think, a big part of how you keep those schools from being overly regulated. And with, All this, right. with this Florida Supreme Court, you're going to see bold action, I think, at the state level for the next few years. All right, we're rapidly running out of time, and I see lots of hands, and that's fine. How about if we do lightning round? Can you make your question quick, and we'll get a quick answer and try to get the rest of the people that I see to it? Can we do that? We'll start in the back, because I see a microphone, and then we'll go from next, next up is Roy. Okay, I think mine will be fairly quick, but um, I wasn't going to say anything, and I'm shaking right now, but um, I, I guess my question is, how does an average mother or father affect the changes? And Erica, when you were talking about your son in, in that first letter that you received, most parents would say, oh, okay, I'm not supposed to do anything. And honestly, I probably would have been that way if I hadn't experienced what I had experienced in the past, because I thought, well, they know better than me. And there are very few who really would step forward and investigate the way that you have, and thank you for that. But how, how do we encourage just an average mom and dad who's maybe not involved in politics, is terribly um, intimidated to be in a room with such um, incredible people who do affect change, but how, how can we be a part of this effort as well? That, that's a great question, and it's a question that we advocates ask ourselves all the time. How do we get parents to be more involved? And it really is political involvement and advocacy um, on a policy level, both at the school board and mostly in Florida at the state. So um, paying attention to what school choice policies are um, coming forward at the state level and helping us to advocate for those policies as a parent um, is really important and to help us get where we need to go. Um, I'll do a, a shameless plug here. I'm, we're launching a, a, something that will help parents to stay involved. Uh, sign up for the movement.org. It will help you to get information about that. But that is going to be a venue to help regular, you know, grassroots people and parents like you and me uh, not to have to run for school board and, and sit there for four years in order to make a difference, but to come together with other parents who are like minded, um, who want these choices and have a bigger voice um, in Tallahassee, where even though we have. Uh, pro school choice, if you will, Republican controlled legislature, governor, it still is very difficult because of the special interest in education to get these policies across the finish line. When you have regular parents coming out and speaking up, uh, it helps our cause tremendously. Have come to Tallahassee with us and never give up. That's so important, never give up. Roy. Speaking of shameless plugs, if you're looking for something you wanna do, you can work with us at Truth and Textbooks. We train volunteers on how to be social studies textbook reviewers from your home. We train you there and then you can help us critique the books that are being used here in Florida. So that's my shameless plug. But my question was, uh, you've talked a great deal about charter schools that are all great and I think the concept's wonderful and I'm a big supporter. In Texas we have 52 Gulen, Fatula Gulen Harmony schools 
that are there that are many con would consider a threat to our national security because of what they're teaching. They are using foreign money to come from out of our, out of our country to influence our school system and our education system. There are nine here in Florida. That's a good thing. Only nine versus 52. Would any of you care to jump on that grenade and discuss the pros and cons of, you're talking about choice, but if you're familiar with the Gulen school system, there are some significant national security issues, some would argue, and what, ideological issues. What are they? I don't know what they are. Go ahead. What are they? I don't know what oh, they are. You're not familiar, if you're not familiar with Tula Gulen, then I won't, yeah. no need to. They, I'm they, against them, though. <laughs> <laughs> you're against them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything other than Hillsborough? No. You are nodding your head, Erica. Are you somewhat familiar with them? I am familiar with them, and uh, I'm, I am uh, definitely more on the libertarian side of things, Where, and I understand your concern. My concern, uh, when this is brought up, and it has been brought up by people who are also pro-school choice, but they would rather not have choice in order to shut down these types of schools, and right. I am not in that camp. Right. I, I think I, I, that if we have a proliferation of choice and a proliferation as a result, I believe that a proliferation of choice is going to result in better civics education uh, for those who are like-minded, like people in this room. For most uh, that everybody. That, for most everybody. That is going to help overcome some of this you know, infiltration of, of uh, contrary ideals um, and but should I'm foreign governments be influencing <laughs> and putting yeah. money into our school system? That's I, I'm not an expert in the Gulen schools. I've read some about them. The biggest complaint I've read is that they are bringing in so they have a connection to Turkey. And again, let me I preface this again by saying I'm no expert in the Gulen schools. Okay. But the biggest complaint I've seen is that they're bringing in Turkish citizens to teach. I haven't read that they're teaching things that are subversive or talking about committing violent acts. Um, I can see a concern, say, if a school is saying, well, we should, you know, you kids should go out and kill people. That would be a problem. I've never seen anything about no, they're, those they're schools not. doing that. And the huge danger, which I think is what Erica was talking about as well, is if we start saying, well, these schools yeah. should not be something you can choose, right. I guarantee you, I read the Huffington Post uh, a lot, uh, because they have education articles. Um, uh, Bless and your they, heart. And they, <laughs> I do it so you don't have to. Um, <laughs> but they have now a pretty regular series and often targeting Florida schools saying these Christian schools right. should not be acceptable places for you to be able to take a scholarship. And so we have to be, I think, very, very hesitant to ever say a particular school is off limits because it almost guarantees that schools we may like are going to be targeted for the same thing. Yeah, I was going to add. I was it's exactly what I was going to say. If if you and I'm not as, I'm not familiar with with the schools you're talking about, but it's not an if then proposition either. I mean, the more yeah. choice you have, the more civic engagement you have, the more understanding of founding principles you have, and so this notion that somehow there's going to be some massive takeover. I, I'm I'm with Erica. I'm on the libertarian side of the free market at the school level because I think it the the positives, and particularly in terms of teaching civics and teaching founding principles, overcomes any concern there. And to Neil's point, that's exactly what I was going to say. If we're going to do that with those schools, then what about those crazy Christian schools? What about the you know these the Jewish the, the, the Jewish schools? If there's a anti-Semitic stringent tone in in some city or some county. Very concerned about that. And that's that. where I, because I would agree with all 100%. I think those are the stance, that, and it, but in Texas with the numbers we have, it's not a different argument, but th that's not articulated enough. We just simply say, shut them down. The consequences are all the things you just talked about, and I don't want that to happen. So thank you. All right. I guess my lightning round didn't strike, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, John my Mark? question is, at, at, the ed, ed, at the educational level, what initiatives to effectuate change in the public domain do you advocate or know of that the students are engaged in? Mm. Not ones that you want to that you want them to be involved in. Uh, as a school board member, um, we had issues where um, a textbook that, if you live in Collier County, your taxpayer dollars paid for, was encouraging students to go to a particular website. Um, 
for to become an advocate against climate change and um, and and the same website was fighting against something that uh, had something about the Trump presidency and being against that. This is in a public school textbook. And it just goes back to the same conversation that we're having. If you don't want your children to, to be taught values and uh, political ideals in public schools, then you need to help us fight for expansion of school choice because they are being taught politics, whoever politics of the person in the front of the room, which um, statistically speaking is going to be a, a liberal um, coming out of teacher colleges. So if you don't like that, um, and it is happening, and, and you know we had teachers encouraging students, giving them extra credit to come and speak um, when it came to transgender issues that were coming before the school board. Um, so this is happening here in Collier County, across the state, across the nation, where um, not just in colleges, because we know it happens there, but in high schools especially, um, students are being encouraged by teachers and by uh, administrators in their schools to become politically active in whatever manner in which the teachers or administrators are um, politically leaning. And it's a huge problem, but it's, it, there are not enough of us uh, to fight it. And the bureaucracy is so massive that even as a school board member, uh, I was unable to really affect huge change in that particular area. Thankfully, I think more people know about it as a result of me utilizing that bully pulpit, but that's not enough to make the changes. And that's why I said it as it, in my conclusion of my service that school choice is absolutely the only thing that's gonna change that and allowing parents to get out of those situations. Because if you tell a parent that this is happening and it's in their student's textbook, what are they gonna say? Well, what am I gonna do about it? They have to take that course. That's the textbook for the course. The AP says they have to take it. So I'll just tell them not to look at it. Well, you That's not to, a good enough answer. Another thing is, you go to school to learn, not to do. So at Hillsdale College, it's a very conservative college. Why? They come there and read old books, including the new books, too. But, you know, it, 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 we don't even ask them any questions about that, and we don't like them to write essays about that. They need to come to do the work we're going to do. And then once they're there, I just had a big talk with the Federalist Society chapter because they wanted to start a journal. And I said, no. And they said, you won't let us do it. And I said, well, no, I won't. And they said, uh, why not? And I, I got out one of my favorite things. It's been on my desk for, since 1978 when the book was published. Uh, and this, this is what school is about. Uh, Abraham Lincoln gave a really great speech in 1858 in Hartford, Connecticut, 1959. And the next day, a journalist got on a train with him and interviewed him. And he said, how would you think of that? It was a very beautiful speech. And Lincoln said, well, you know, when I was a young lawyer, I kept running across the word demonstrate. And I decided that I needed to learn what that extraordinary level of proof was. And so I worked and worked. And finally, I decided I can't do it here. So I left my position and went home to my father's house and did not return until I could repeat all of the propositions in the six books of Euclid from memory. That's school. And until you've done that, you're not qualified to change the policies of the nation. Although, of course, arguing about them and all the stuff kids do, that's fun and that's fine. But at Hillsdale College, we don't organize for them to do that. And that's because we want them to learn. And then, you know, then they go do that. Well, that, and that means that these teachers and, and schools that are organizing these, these kids into political forces are doing them a gross disservice, whatever the, mar the, the, the merit, of the cause they get them to take up. Well, I started out being unpopular. I'm going to end up being unpopular because we got to stop. Do we, do we really have to have one more? We have one more. All right. <laughs> one more. So I won't be quite as unpopular. <laughs> I know there's going to be many more questions that we can get to, but... Um, hi, my name is Cody Frosch. I'm a student here at FGCU. Um, my question is in relationship to, um, do you see the historic or present barrier of the separation of church and state staying as a barrier against school choice reform becoming at the level that um, a lot of you have spoken about desiring? Uh, I'll say something about that because we've been doing some really groundbreaking work in this regard. Um, that's not really true, but um, the first thing I'd say is uh, it's worth understanding that the church-state separation isn't that big a barrier, depending on your state. 
um, to school choice and that we've seen Supreme Court cases sort of, not all about education, but kind of pulling down some of the barriers for, for uh, money to follow a student based on the free choices of their parents to a school that they want. Um, and we have been starting to promote the idea that in fact, if government is going to fund schools, I actually think there's a very good argument that those schools cannot have a religious character to them because we have people of all different religions, non-religion, very diverse people. However, that makes religious people essentially unequal under the law because the one thing those schools can't do is teach devotional religion. So we're starting to advance the argument with the help of lawyers and probably Bob Levy's the one who should really do this because he's a great lawyer and I'm kind of an idiot. But to begin to make the case that the Constitution may in fact require that people be given school choice, at least religious people, and I actually don't want it restricted to religion, but this seems to be the legal avenue you have to follow, but religious people would have to be given the money to choose a religious school because the schools they're currently forced to fund cannot teach the religion they want. They could teach anything else, they may not choose to, but there's nothing else they legally prohibited from doing. So I think we've seen a lot of progress since Zelman v. Simmons Harris in 2001, where the Supreme Court said, School choice, a voucher's okay as long as the free choice of the parents. Moving more and more to saying that the system right now discriminates against different kinds of people and that they should have a right to school choice. We're not anywhere close to establishing that, but we're moving in that direction. All right, let me exercise being unpopular and suggest this. If you have a question, maybe you could come up and talk to some of the panelists. Would that be all right? Could you do that? Sure. Do we I just need my one quick question? One, one more? Okay, lightning round is going to be proven right here. Okay, uh, my question deals with uh, advocacy and parental choice. I remember uh, several years ago the, uh, we had a uh, legislation piece called the Parent Trigger Bill, and I remember PTAs from the school districts coming up to testify in Tallahassee saying that we don't know what's best for our children. It should be left up to the teachers, not for us. We're yeah. not good enough for that. And that reminded me of uh, the letter you got. Uh, the, the PTA is funded and controlled by the teachers' union. Oh. Is that lightning around? That, was, that was lightning around. <laughs> All right. All right. So where do we go from here? Who wants a better education? <laughs> Every child. And us. And we want to thank our panelists for helping pointing us in that direction. Don't you think so? Actually, I think we've been in a classroom tonight because I think we've all learned. What do we do next? Well, Florida Citizens Alliance always invites your partnership and all of the usual things we'd be happy for you to join us with. That's the idea, but take a look at these pictures. Maybe you'd like to go to Tallahassee. There we were up there last week. Maybe you'd like to join us and see what that process is about. It will be an eye opener. You will love it, you will other things about it, but it's important and we'd like to invite you to be a part of it. Maybe you'd like to be a part of some of our other events. We hosted Ashley Moody here in Naples back during the campaign. You see her picture up there, she's now the Attorney General. You get a chance to meet some of these. We'd love your partnership because we don't want to quit. But mostly, it's about our children. All of us care about the future, all of us care about our kids. And that's why we do what we do. You have children, you have grandchildren, so do I. When I see them, I realize why it matters and why I can't remain silent. And we want to invite you to be a part of that. And now I'm going to put on my pastor hat and invite you to join me. We've talked to each other about all of this. Let's talk to God as we wind up our time together and ask him to bless us and our children as we work to make a better world for them. Father, we are grateful for what we've learned tonight. We are grateful for the children you've entrusted to us. And all across our state, there are children that are eager to learn, want to learn, need our help. Thank you for the privilege of, that we have to speak up for them. Help us never to grow weary, to give up, but to always persevere so that we can make the best future for them. Thank you for these people who have shared our time together. Inspire us to do something that we can advance to help our kids to be better citizens, better people, have the most opportunities that we can give them. And it's in your name we pray for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, thank you very much. Hang around. Thanks for coming.